right, we'll call the recess board of commissioners meeting to order, please. Uh, will somebody make a motion we have the adoption of the agenda? I'm making a motion that we adopt the agenda. Is there a second? No second. Motion second to adopt the agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Consent agenda. Thank you, thank you. Uh, can we have a motion for the consent agenda? I move to adopt the consent agenda. Second? Second. 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 There's a motion and a second for the approval of the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. <coughs> motion carries. Okay. James, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item number four on the agenda. This is a section called presentations and reports. And we are pleased to have back our department heads here to present both to the Board of Commissioners as well as to the general public. We'll go ahead and get started with our team as we work through our slideshow and then go to our spotlight presentation. Our, our, water, our, water, our water, and, water and sewer director will be presenting first. Good evening, Josh O'Brien, Water and Sewer Department. The return of the snapshot uh, that I like to start the presentation with for the Water and Sewer Department. This, I'm not going to dive into every single bolded item, um, but for the trained eye, a couple things stand out to me. First, service location requests, which are um, 811 tickets. Uh, we're still seeing a high number of those at 45 for both water and sewer for the month. Um, really, everything else looks like a busy month in June. Again, this is for June, not for July. Uh, I don't know One of those items um, for main blockages is, is, is an item that's bolded um, with one that we never like to see. Um, matter of fact, I can't tell you the last time we had a mainline blockage in the sewer system. That was due, and I'm skipping here to the collection system maintenance to the before and after picture, it was due to a sewer line clean out that was underground that we didn't know about that was below grade. The only reason we knew about it was uh, because of the sinkhole. Um, it's not the largest picture there on the screen, but on the left side, what you're seeing is inside a manhole, as well as the after picture. And what had happened was, I don't know how long it had been like that, but over quite some time, sediment, dirt had washed into the sewer lines and clogged the pipe. So thankfully, um, because of the Board of Commissioners, we do have our own back truck um, that was purchased, I think, eight to 10 years ago. So we were able to handle this in-house and it took um, about two to three days off and on to clean the, the pipes, the sewer mains. Um, and as the after picture shows, uh, that's what a manhole should look like. That's a newer precast manhole with uh, PVC lines, um, as opposed to some of our older manholes in town with the, with the brick and, and terracotta clay, clay mains. Um, so that's something that we unforeseen had to address in June. Um, also on the water side, our annual drinking water quality report is now available online. Um, hard copies are also available at Town Hall. That report is for the 2020 year at the wastewater treatment facility, aka WWTP. Um, you see the other picture here is our sludge holding lagoon. Uh, we conducted our sludge holding hall, uh, which was from the period of uh, January through June, January through June um, and we re removed close to 300,000 gallons of stabilized sludge uh, via contractor. So thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. I'm Carl Woody, the IT director for the town of Mania. Um, we installed the uh, Wi-Fi at the town commons. Um, as you probably know, the Wi-Fi equipment is not pretty. Um, it's a bunch of antennas sitting out there. Uh, so what we decided to do is in that nice little building that's on the town commons, install everything in there. So we installed it in there, did a test run. We were able to sit at the furthest bench, have Wi-Fi connectivity working fine. So I said, great, we're going to leave it in there. So it just looks a lot better. It's just, I, it looked like big ears on the side of that little building there. You know, it just wouldn't be pretty. Um, the other one is the interactive online maps. 
I don't know if you've seen this on our website or not, but it's a map that we actually use a product called ArcGIS to create, and uh, we pulled some information from Dare County, put it in the map, and then we created a web interface in front of it that allows people to search for their address to see if their address is in town limits. So, uh, so it's a neat little app, um, very functional, um, and I think, uh, I guess a lot of the issues they have here at the front desk is people call, don't know that they're in town limits, but they have a manual address. So this will help them uh, figure out who they are, where they're at, if they're in the limits, and so forth. Uh, the interactive kiosk, I don't know if you've seen them yet, these are the three kiosks that we got. Um, one's, or two are 42 inch and one's a 32 inch. Um, typically these kiosks run about 5,000 a piece. We were able to get a deal through um, Granville. They were updating their showroom. They, um, these were in their showroom and we got them all for 7,000. So we were able to save a lot of money for that and they come with a three year warranty and so forth. And uh, so, what we're doing is we've reached out to the Outer Banks History Center. We've got over 200 audio and image files from them related to boat building. Uh, uh, it's boat building, the lighthouse. We've got the schematics of the lighthouse and all that stuff. We've also reached out to the U.S. Coast Guard Historian Office and the National Archives. And what we're trying to get a hold of are law books that maybe the lighthouse had um, or the P. Island Cookhouse has that uh, we can actually get an image of that. They say they do have them, but because of COVID, they're not allowing anybody going up there to get that information. So they said if we know of a date, a sniffer, a date, they can pull the logs and scan them for us because right now they are not electronic. So they're all just hard um, copies right now. Uh, but what we have to do now is we have to find a provider that's going to provide the design and the development of these interactive kiosks. Um, so we're working on that right now, and then they'll take all this content that we gathered, make it pretty, make it functional. Um, I guess the kiosk locations are going to be one at the, the lighthouse, one in the boathouse, and one at the cookhouse. And uh, that's all I have. Any questions? I'm Barry Wicker, uh, Waterfront Operations. Uh, our youth sailing program began June 14th. This is our 21st season for the youth sailing program. So over the 21 years, we've probably done about 2,000 sailors. We're actually seeing some sailors in this year's program who are kids of sailors who did it 21 years ago. Um, we've had 87 sailors registered to date in the program this summer. And also our Tuesday evening sailing program is going real well. Uh, Tuesday evening sailing allows the sailors, who, any sailor who's gone through our youth sailing program to come back on Tuesday nights and just take a friend, go out sailing by themselves. Some of them take their parents out and just sail around Shallow Bag Bay for a couple hours. On the marina side, we had 50 boats visit the marina in June. Uh, every boat that ties up at the marina gets a copy of, or gets a link to Discover Manio, our webpage, so they know what's going on in town. Um, the average stay for March, I mean for, um, for June, was seven nights. And we're starting to see boats come in, stay for a day or two, and extend for a day or two. So that's good for you know, our revenue plus businesses downtown also. Uh, for the 12 month period, into June 30, we had 388 boats visit the marina last fiscal year. And June also uh, marks the first anniversary of our use of DACWA, which is our marina operations software, which operates basically just like a hotel reservation system. Uh, boaters select the days they want to come into the marina. We receive an email. We confirm their reservation, assign them a slip, and it operates, uh, handles all the third-party credit card operation. It's a real slick little system. Uh, some upcoming events at the museum. Saturday, July 31st, will be our 18th annual uh, One Design Regatta. We've got boats coming from Newburn, Hatteras, and Duck. Right now we have 40 sailors so far signed up to attend that event. So it's 40 sailors plus their parents. So that should be a good time. On Saturday, August 14th, we've got the 8th annual Kids Fishing Tournament. 
That's also a big event. We usually have about 100 kids show up for that. And Saturday, October 30th, is our ninth annual wooden book show. And I can't forget the volunteers. Uh, volunteers play a big part at the Maritime Museum. We had 144 hours during the month of June. Some of the projects they did were uh, get prepped up for the summer course. And they're always out replacing a plank here or there on the boardwalk. And they also touched up paint on the lighthouse, both the white and the shutters. And that's all I have. Any questions? Thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Vance Haskin, Chief of Police. Uh, the training we had for June, I uh, took a class on six big roles of a great leader uh, in anti-harassment. Investigator Moore attended Internet Crimes Against Children as the task force for the State Bureau of Investigation. Investigator Steele uh, had training on child death investigations. Uh, on K-9, Investigator Moore completed uh, four K-9 deployments on traffic stops for June uh, 2 of the, uh, the Sheriff's Department, and he also did a K-9 demonstration for a church youth group. Uh, for June, we had 116 dispatched calls from Central Communications, and then our total calls for June were 1,766. That's included self-initiated. Uh, we had 19 investigations, uh, 15 out of those 19 have been closed and cleared. Uh, we had 21 ordinance violations, uh, that was mainly on um, parking violations. And that's about all I have. Thank you. Can, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, what's uh, golf carts in the time limits? What, what restrictions are on the golf carts in the time it, limits? The golf cart town limits it, it has to have plates it has to have everything that a regular vehicle would have unless it's of course a state golf cart or, you know, or a town golf cart that has got permission to, to be on the town it pretty much has to pass inspection um, they do make some golf carts that do have blinkers and the seat belts and everything in them but most of the golf carts are not legally drive on state Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Shannon Twitty, your finance director. I don't have any pretty pictures, but I still have some great news. The 2021-22 budget and the ordinance has been posted on the Town of Manio website. Carl Woody will be maintaining that with the tableau, which will give everybody real-time expenditures and revenues. So if you haven't checked it out, Feel free to do so. So I am now in the middle of closing out fiscal year 2021. That is very methodical. We are beginning with the payables that will be received and recorded for revenues prior to June 30th and expenditures incurred prior to June 30th. So I am working currently in both years for the staff of the finance department as we prepare for the audit. The auditor has reached out and would like to be here the dates of August 30th and August 31st, so I have responded. Our workman's comp audit is scheduled for September 13th, and I wanted to also report that Joe Briggs, the newest member of the finance department, has been working on professional certifications and has just completed the utility billing course and is now currently taking the financial management class, which is one of the five required for a certified or finance officer certification. So if anyone has any questions of me, please don't hesitate to ask, and I thank you very much. Good evening. Frankie Woodley, Public Work Director. For the month of June, uh, we installed a steel plate cover over the drop, a drain inlet running from the Tranquil House parking lot to Queen Elizabeth Avenue. Uh, we uh, removed tree roots, from the sidewalk in front of the candy shop on Bud Lee and reinstalled the brakes along that sidewalk. And we grinded down the sidewalk in front of the cookhouse and we painted the fence around the rain garden off the highway. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Michelle Bunce with the Community and Economic Development Department. 
and hopefully you guys got this already, but this is the new Town of Manio, newly updated walking and bicycling map. We're so excited they're finally here. Um, the town did acquire a grant for those um, from the Albemarle Regional Planning Organization. It was a mini grant, so it was no cost to the town, which was another exciting point of that. And they've already been distributed to the Outer Banks Visitors Bureau, all of their locations, as well as some of the local businesses have already gotten them and we'll still be distributing those throughout the town. And then they're also obviously available here at Town Hall. Um, and they're also with some of the staff that are riding around town and that, that kind of you know engage with the community a lot. So they're available in their vehicles, which is also really, really exciting. So if you want any, we have some um, and definitely happy to share them. Um, the Special Events Committee has been busy. They are working on strategic planning and training, which is another exciting component we just introduced to them. So not only um, do they work hard on planning and looking at the overall picture of special events in the town, but we did ask them if they were interested in doing some training so when they're volunteering at the events that they have the same training staff does because they are working the events. So something, for example, like crowd gathering um, training and things like that. Something that would be very helpful for them. And it's also part of our safety committee initiatives. So um, it fit really well. And they were super excited and wanted to do that. So we're moving forward with that. Um, did just recently join the International Live Events Association. It used to be called ISIS. Um, <laughs> for obvious reasons, they have renamed themselves, even though they were around a long time before. Um, this is really exciting. This is an international group, as it says. This is not just within the state of North Carolina. This is all over the world. Um, I have been to these events before when I worked for the state of North Carolina, and they were very, very informative. Um, what's great about them is not just another, it's not just another organization where you go to some events and you have a nice time, and that is part of it, but it's more focused on education. So you're learning more about the discipline of special events and you get information shared and networked all over the world, which is really exciting. So super excited to have that. Um, if you want more information, I'll be happy to share that as well. But they do have a website, you can go on there. And then there's regional chapters and the town of Manio is going to be a member of the Raleigh Triad area. Um, the Downtown Associate Community Program is super exciting. It's moving, it's going. Um, and we're actually getting ready to have our next meeting next Wednesday at 4. If you didn't hear that, it was Wednesday at 4. We would love to have you. Um, so right now we are still collecting and organizing the data, like you see here, about community assets, economic drivers, um, a bunch of different information. And the groups um, that have been attending those meetings did a really wonderful job on giving us that data and their input. It was really exciting, and they got excited giving that input. Um, but we do have some more to go, so we'll be meeting next Wednesday and looking at some other um, components. Two of them will be um, just briefly touching on the uh, four-point approach, but then we'll get up with that as well later on. But other than that, that's it in a nutshell, and we're happy to, to share any of that information with you if you like. Good evening, I'm Melissa Dickerson, your town planner. I have a few updates um, for you all regarding projects. Um, we recently met with the engineer and architect regarding phase two of the town common. Phase two will include a structure with bathrooms, um, drinking fountains or water bottle fountains, um, shade structures, um, and additional landscaping. We also held a project kicked off meeting with the engineer on the Davis lot. As well, we kicked off the West Side Stormwater Project um, and did a site visit that included um, walking the entire system on that side um, with, an with two engineers, and that is currently in the design phase. It's great to be moving forward um, with these projects. Thank you, Woody. Um, I'm also excited to get to share some long-awaited news with you today, um, but first, some background. You may recall back in 2019, the planning department completed a review for the Building Code Effectiveness Grading Schedule, or BSEGS. The Insurance Services Office, or ISO, conducts the review to help distinguish communities with effective building code adoption and enforcement through this comprehensive program. The BSEGS program assigns each municipality a grade of one being exemplary to 10. Prior to the 2019 BSEGS review, the town's BSEGS rating was a seven. In 2019, the town's new rating increased to a four. 
As you know, the town participates in the National Flood Insurance Program's Community Rating System, or CRS. Similar to BSEGS, the town receives a rating from FEMA for its CRS program. The BSEGS and CRS classification are related because the town's CRS class cannot be lower than the BSEGS class. So in order for a CRS class to be improved from a seven, an improved BSEG score was first required. Last fall, the town conducted its five-year review for CRS, and on July 9th, we received confirmation from FEMA of an improved classification from a seven to a five. This will provide additional discounts for flood insurance policies for properties located in a special flood hazard area beginning on October 1st of this year. A copy of the letter from FEMA is provided to you, and as part of the CRS review, we made an informal informational video um, and updated the video last week once we received this notification to reflect this great news. Hello, I'm Melissa Dickerson, the town planner for the town of Manio. As part of my job as town planner, I'm also the town's floodplain administrator. The town of Manio, located on Roanoke Island, is surrounded by water. Shalabag Bay, the Roanoke Sound, and the Croatan Sound can all cause tidal flooding that can inundate the town of Manio. Heavy rains, tropical storms, and hurricanes have all affected the town in recent years. Due to frequent flooding, residents need to be aware of the potential flooding that can occur. Flooding is one of the town's most frequent hazards. The town has quite a history of floods. The weather tower located near the Roanoke Marshes Lighthouse has a high water mark from Hurricane Irene, which hit in 2011. That high water mark from NOAA notes that the floodwaters from Hurricane Irene was seven feet and 11 inches above mean sea level. When weather conditions are likely to cause flooding, the town staff monitor conditions in flood prone areas. Staff also prepare for potential flooding by staging barricades and deploying high water signs. When possible, the town also sends emergency alerts notifying community members of the potential risk of flooding. You can sign up for those emergency alerts by visiting the town's website at www.manionc.gov. When flooding occurs, do not enter flood waters. Turn around, don't drown. The town of Manio has a no-wake ordinance for its streets. This means that when streets are flooded, it is illegal to drive on those flooded streets. There's a $250 fine for violating this ordinance. This law is intended to keep the public safe. As well, when vehicles travel along flooded streets, the wake caused by that traffic can slosh and cause flooding in businesses or residents located along flooded streets. The Town of Manio participates in the National Flood Insurance Program, which is a federally subsidized program that enables property owners to purchase flood insurance in return for community adoption of specific flood damage reduction planning and building criteria. The Town of Manio has been a participant in the flood insurance program since 1973. This insurance is required for property owners who are located in a designated special flood hazard area and have a federally backed mortgage. For more information on the requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program, contact Planning Department staff. The Town of Manio participates in the Community Rating System, or CRS, which is a voluntary program associated with the National Flood Insurance Program. CRS communities conduct activities beyond the minimum requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program. Effective October 2021, the Town of Manio's CRS classification will be a five, two levels improved from its previous classification. This provides property owners with potential additional reductions on flood insurance premiums. Insure your property. Flood damage is not covered by your homeowner's insurance. Don't wait until it's too late. The National Flood Insurance Program guidelines require a 30-day waiting period from the date of purchase to the time a flood insurance policy goes into effect. Call your insurance agent to discuss your flood coverage or visit www.floodsmart.gov for more information. New flood maps for the town of Manio were adopted and effective on June 19th of 2020. The town's board of commissioners adopted a new flood damage prevention ordinance along with the flood maps. The flood damage prevention ordinance regulates development in the town to reduce the risk of flood damage to properties. Keep your flood insurance. 
Over 500 properties were removed from the special flood hazard area in Manio under the new flood maps. It's important to note that flood maps only depict those areas subject to a 1% annual chance of flooding and do not reflect other flooding sources such as heavy rainfall or elevated groundwater levels. Floods can happen anywhere. Natural hazards and storms are a part of living on Roanoke Island and the sustainability of our community depends on managing flood hazards from all sources. The town of Manio takes flooding risk very seriously. We are here to help you determine the risk to your property and help you mitigate that risk. We have documents provided by FEMA that may guide you in making appropriate property protection decisions for your property and your families. Please feel free to call us with any flood related questions you may have at 252-473-4112. Mayor Owens, members of the Board of Commissioners. Yeah, that, that last report was excellent. Uh, uh, very good, Melissa. I think we need to make aware as much as possible. People should look at their flood insurance and make sure just because it's a little bit cheaper, they want to drop it. They certainly ought not drop it in many. Uh, they ought to keep it where it is because we are, like she mentioned, all the water around us and we're going to get wet every time the wind changes. Uh, I just think it's a good report, Melissa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of, of the board. The, that concludes our department head, head reports. Of course, our department heads are available for any questions, and we will, as, as um, the mayor suggested, get the word about not just about the flood insurance, but about the efforts of the team to help reduce flood insurance rates for residents here in the town. If it's, if it's all right with you, Mr. Go Mayor, ahead, we'll yeah. move forward. The next item on the agenda, this is also under presentations and reports. This is an update on town sponsored special events. This particular item includes both uh, an update on all of our events going on, but also a special spotlight on the New Year's Eve activities as a result of requests from members of members of the board. So we'll go ahead and get started with this. Um, and we'll go ahead, Woody, as we move, move through the slideshow. So the very first slide we have here is, it talks about the actual we'll call them organization level events. These are, the, these are the big ones. These are the ones the whole organization <laughs> and works on. And of course, we've already, started, we've already started with some of these. Of course, the downtown market got started, started mid-May, and we were so pleased to have that come back and appreciated the board's support for that. It does run through mid-September. This one actually has a relatively small budget because we have the existing venue, one of the, probably the best farmer's market venue anywhere in the Outer Banks, right on the, right on the waterfront. Um, and it is, we have, we have heard um, a, lot of, a lot of good from, from this. We were thankful that our vendors were coming back. We did have a few vendors who said they kind of liked having their Saturdays again during the pandemic and didn't come back, and that's okay, but we supported the ones who did. We, we supported our vendors throughout the pandemic with, uh, with social media and other, other means, and the ones who have come. We've had a number report actually rather high sales in certain categories this year. Uh, we are continuing to try and recruit additional folks, uh, especially in the produce side. We had a couple of vendors drop, uh, drop out, including one produce vendor after a short period of time as they uh, ran out of materials. Um, we also, the board had, and that, we also had the board budget um, throughout the year, so be various times, additional community, you know, neighborhood level events and children's events. We do have a budget of 20,000 for that, and we will continue to work on those, both with staff and the special events committee. As we, as we get information on those, we'll make sure to, uh, to get together with the board. And now that we are hoping that COVID is receding, we would start to getting closer to these neighborhood level events. Um, of course, dare days, and I used specifically say dare days, as we had spoken back uh, back in uh, uh, two months ago. Our, the goal is to expand dare day next year into dare days, so so we can involve the entire town and activate not just downtown, but also the highway corridor as well as the west side. So a multi-day event, um, and that is also in the budget. So that's of course traditionally the fir that first Saturday in June is the dare day, but we're expanding that around it. Um, Fourth of July, of course, we just had the event, and the event, um, we would had some very positive feedback on that particular event. Um, the particularly pos overwhelmingly positive were, was the feedback on the fireworks themselves, Pyrotechnico, they uh, did themselves, uh, and we've, we've had the same project manager for a number of events in a row, so working with him, he's, we've really got a good, good science on how we work with our team, 
uh, from law enforcement to public works, uh, emergency management, et cetera. Um, we also had a couple of items that came up. One, we also had very positive feedback with the addition of lawn games and things like that. It started with kids playing with them, and as the evening progressed, the adults were out there playing cornhole and four square and whatever it might be. A um, couple things that we had some, some other feedback. In general, the bands got very positive feedback, but we did have two complaints about the band. I'm not sure I can solve that, um, solve every musical taste, but we want to be res res respectful and responsive to feedback uh, and, and vary music. Also, uh, the question came up about bringing a, a, a bunch of food trucks in because we have a lot of people. Um, we did have, we did follow what we had before where we had a, a Buddy Brown came in. Um, he had less of a presence than he did before in terms of food. Uh, he had funnel cakes and treats. We brought in another treat. We had reached out to a number of nonprofits to try and supplement that since Buddy had part of his organization uh, not there. Um, but staffing problems seem to have affected a lot of folks. Um, we did specifically, though, not turn this into a food truck event. We'd gone back to minutes of prior meetings where we'd seen very clearly that the local restaurants were concerned about bringing a lot of food trucks, except for an established event like Dare Day, which is all day, versus an event like this, which started at 3, not during the lunch hour. And so it was really that, that period around the dinner time. We did have a number of restaurants open that were uh, doing very well. We did have a couple that were closed um, that apparently were not able to staff up for it. But if the board would like to revisit the issue of food trucks, we'd be happy to discuss that. We're just being respectful of what we've seen from prior and minutes of prior meetings. So that, but th that's kind of the, the positive and negative feedback that we got from 4th of July. But uh, the, the bottom line was a safe and fun event and our first big event since the uh, lifting of pandemic restrictions. So we were pleased to see so many folks out and about. Um, that's the 4th of July. Now, of course, you see next on the list up there, Christmas events and decorations. I kind of consolidated those two line items because we've got the Christmas event, of course, the Christmas tree lighting and all those activities, especially with the kids, as well as the Christmas parade. And we also have money in there for additional decorations. Over the years, we wanted to make sure to try and replace the decorations that either get tired or have electrical shorts and <laughs> things like that to make sure we're operating safely. Um, and of course, that first weekend in December will be busy. Now, we have already start, uh, started, you know, both internal staff as well as engaging with our special events committee and then a subcommittee that will work with that. Um, we want to not only do the traditional events we've had, but also bring some of the ones that we did in the pandemic era, like perhaps if, if we can do it, Santa's Ride again, except this time, publish the names of the roads, because now crowd gathering is not restricted. Um, bring in some of the fun contests and things like that. And we had a couple other suggestions from our special events committee and other community members, so we're going to incorporate those. So more news will be coming, but we'll, plans are full steam ahead for a, for a, a great uh, Christmas, Christmas celebration. And of course, New Year's Eve. Um, we're showing in this particular example uh, a $20,000 allocation in our budget. Of course, the date's December 31st. And uh, we'll actually talk a little bit more about New Year's Eve in a second as we kind of talk through what, you know, what are the current plans and what are what some, of the, uh, some of the feedback the members of the board may have been getting. But let's make a distinction between large organizational events and move to the next slide where it talks about departmental or department level events. Now these are things that are more aimed uh, uh, and organized traditionally by a specific department. So National Night Out is coming up the first Tuesday in August, August 3rd in this case. National Night Out is a national event sponsored by law enforcement, in our case the Manual Police Department. So you'll see that on there as an event primarily organized them, but with support from town staff, uh, special events committee, and we'll also have some members of our community police advisory board attending as well. That kind of community interaction is just so important with that. You also see three in a row here that are, are primarily led by the Maritime Museum. Um, the, and Barry also already mentioned the report, some of these, so you heard about the, the Summer One Design Regatta, uh, of course the Wooden Boat Show, but I'm also particularly happy the Kids Fishing Tournament. Now last year we had to space out the Kids Fishing Tournament, make it virtual, I mean they're still catching real fish, they were catching real fish, but they just had to take their picture and send it in for drawings. This year we'll be back to the real competitive nature folks down on the boardwalk having fun on a specific day at a specific time and really having a good time. And that one, we, it was, uh, we really were happy to see that one come back as well. So, but those types of, those particular events are typically organized at the department level with assistance from town staff and or other, other special committees. So that's the department level. Now if we go to the next slide, these are just some samples. The town processes dozens of um, third party event applications uh, throughout the course of the year. And we will work with uh, event organizers walking through everything from you know, planning processes, uh, you know, ro you know, roadway issues, parking issues, really help them through the permitting process. And the earlier they get, the better. 
In fact, some of these came, came to us uh, even back in 2020 as they were preparing. So that we're first ones, first Friday. And you would be amazed by how many people call Town Hall and say, well, when's the town doing first Friday? And of course, it's not a town of Venice, it's their county arts council, and they, but they, they were happy to come back and with their first first Friday in July. Um, we saw some people, but I think people have to get back into the rhythm of it too because it was off for so long due to, due to COVID. Um, of course, the, Ju uh, the, the Juneteenth celebration, um, we, and this, it's here it was shown at the organizers of PLM Preservation Society, Inc., or PIPSI, but we also had another event organized at Cartwright Park, so we want to make sure we're working with all event organizers who we may be working together on a particular day. I think in this case, what we try to do is organize, for example, traffic control, uh, law enforcement, making sure that people are safe if they were work walking back and forth, say, between the Cook House and the park, et cetera. So when events occur on the same day, we want to make sure to work together early. Um, of course, some of these events are, are, are in different locations. We've got the Pirates Cove, of course, the tournament's coming up uh, just right around the corner here in August, and that's a, that, those are, that's a, that's a big event there. And then also in August, we've got the New World Festival of the Arts. Another one that people think is run by the town, but is actually run by the Arts Council. But it is on, it is on you know, town property, it's been a long-running event, you know, juried art show, and then artists basically all along the waterfront. So pretty exciting, a pretty exciting another, another group of people to bring in. OBX Pride Fest, uh, this, uh, the OBX Pride group, they actually came to us back in 2020. They wanted to get, the, get their date reserved for George Washington Creek Park. Um, and then outside of, you know, kind of outside of our park areas, oh, the Bluegrass Festival is over there on Roanoke Island Festival Park, so over there on state property. But that one's coming up in October, and I know they'd had to deal with some cancellations last year and, of course, weather-related issues in the past, but that event draws a lot of people and a lot of good artists and talents, so that will be interesting to see that one come back as well. And of course, it's called Kids Event. It's really, we just should just say it's Halloween, but the Coastal Family Church, uh, also in Mount Olivet, would typically, there's another example of an event on Halloween where you've got two groups working kind of in the same area. So that's why we want to make sure we get groups working together. When this happened in 2019, we actually brought together the two event organizers in town hall, sat down with them, and said, you know, how can we work together and not have you two like running into each other, bumping into each other, or have traffic flow wrong? So this, these, these third party events, we all want to make sure we coordinate properly. Well, let's roll into another, another event that had been a third party event, um, New Year's Eve. So if we go into the next slide here, and right now the current plan, what's currently here, is we've got a $20,000 appropriation in the budget ordinance. And of course that, that ordinance is set by the Board of Commissioners. Um, our direction was to provide a family friendly evening event, and the expected duration of this was kind of similar to what we'd had the family part last year, uh, five, sorry, last year, in 2019, uh, five o'clock to eight, eight o'clock. Um, this, the activities that were to focus on, like children's activities and expand their, you know, the games, the booths, the food, the music, the face painting, uh, bring in various kinds of entertainment. We had brought in uh, face painters, magicians, things like that. Uh, but we want to make sure we have a good uh, array of things for them to do over the, that period. And then, of course, the children's early ball drop at 8 o'clock p.m. So that was kind of the gist of, of the direction we had before, and that $20,000 appropriation does, does support that level of event. Now, we understood, understood that there had been some some feedback um, being solicited um, by, uh, by the organi uh, organizers of, of the prior event. And so previous events, we'll show on the next slide here, called New, Wor New Year in the New World. And in this case, that event was held in 2017, 2018, and 2019. Understood the first one was a little bit chilly, but the second one got better weather and better attendance and, and folks apparently enjoyed it. And then of course in 2019, uh, we, uh, that, we, we had that, that particular event with the full, the full, uh, full thing. So the, Typical duration of these was five o'clock to midnight. Of course, that's when, the, that's when it goes off. The children's activities and the early ball drop at eight was part of the program, but then afterwards there was more music, food, entertainment, and activities, um, and the fireworks at midnight. So that was, that was kind of the scope of the new year and the new world over the, its first three years. Now, this is a third party event. It was founded by, and I use the phrase organizing committee, I just use that phrase loosely because it is a group of, of a couple of local merchants and a merchant from across the bridge. Um, so it wasn't really a single entity or a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, but each year it did have assistance from the town of Manio in various forms. So since they weren't a 501c3, they couldn't apply for the fireworks grant. So the town stepped into that role as an entity eligible for the fireworks grant or event grant. Uh, also, other assistance from the town of Manio included things from staff work and other, other kind of financial support and assistance, including in-kind contributions like the staff and materials. Now, if we go to the next slide, there have been some requests for information regarding this as, as it's an item of, to be considered. So first one, minutes of prior meetings, that was requested by one of the event organizers, 
and um, the town clerk was able to dig up the minutes of prior meetings. Now, there are 60 pages to uh, of materials to see that if you look at the transcript and the excerpts from the minutes. So there have been a lot of discussions on this since 2017. Um, one of the biggest takeaways, it was clear from the board's direction that it's not a town-owned event, but that the town would be providing assistance. And that seemed consistent year, year over year. Um, also, the other information that was solicited was the financial information. And our finance director was actually was able to go back into the prior year, into the prior years, uh, because we have audited, audited financial statements from prior years, was actually able to, to pull that information. So what you'll see here is, um, I just put a little, a little sheet up here, just to kind of compare apples to apples year over year. So 2017, we had, rev we had revenues here, uh, 15, 15 grand in Outer Banks Visitors Bureau grant, donations and vendor fees, 9164 and change. And then, so the revenues were a little over 24 grand. Uh, expenses were, uh, were 38,832 and change. Um, there was a net loss on that at 14,667.37. Now, please note that these numbers exclude staff time, overtime, material, et cetera, provided by the town uh, as in-kind contributions. 2018, revenues were, were, were up. Now, the grant, the Visitors Bureau grant that the town procured from the Visitors Bureau went up from 15 to 17.5. Also, donations and vendor fees um, the, the, the donations solicited by the organizing organizing committee, those rate those were raised higher, and so our subtotal revenue is 34 and 634. Of course, expenses went up. We know that fireworks going from a land base to a barge base, we've seen those increase over the years. So the fees for those have gone up um, as as well as their costs. So so expenses went up, revenues went up, and the loss here was roughly the same, 15,452. And then in 2019, the last year it was held. Uh, the grant increased again this year, that year to 20,000. Now, donations and vendor fees were 3,500 in donations solicited by the organizing committee with two, two donations and 250 in vendor fees from Buddy Brown. So re revenues 23,750. Expenditures were up again with the, with the barge and the, um, um, uh, the fireworks were up. So the loss was 37,494. So those are, those are kind of the financial numbers of the, the contributions being made to support, to support this event. Um, now, it does, but it does raise policy issues. Um, the, the idea of when you're talking about a big event and with some of the suggestions that have been made out, um, made out there, um, let's talk at the policy level, because here we're appearing before the Board of Commissioners. So first on, we, we talk about, if we've got policy issues up here, so changing a budget appropriation would require action by the Board of Commissioners. Now, if the board wants to change something, there's a couple different actions. So for example, if the board chooses to take action, change this event the way it's currently configured, you could eliminate another event and that just becomes a budget transfer. Or we could, in, the board could increase the appropriation by using a budget amendment for you know a, an increased appropriation. So the board, if that was something the board wanted to do, we could bring that to you next time. So those are a couple mechanisms should you choose to, to change the current configuration. Also, if the, the changing the event ownership will require action by the board. So in other words, if the ownership of this, this event went from a, an organizing committee, third party, to a town-owned event, that's another thing that has implications with insurance, liability, and permitting. So that would require you know, board action as appropriate. So we want to make sure we're, we're following your direction. Also, the grant. We would, if, this event, if this event changed anyway, we would, we would definitely go after a grant from the Outer Banks Business Bureau. Uh, spoke to their administrator a couple times in the last uh, couple weeks, including today. The grant period is from August 1st through 15th, so if the board wanted to do something at its August 1st, August meeting, we would want to hear from the board so that we could go ahead and make that grant application, and that would be within that window. But even though the town managers delegated the authority to apply for a grant, the board must make grant acceptance. So that, that would still, again, be a vote of the board at that time. Um, the other thing in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the policy level, and this is really what you're thinking about special events. Special events generally fall into the realm of community and economic development. They're meant to, from the community side, meant to bring together the community, be a fun event for community members to get together and see each other, and maybe now in the post-COVID world hug and <laughs> shake hands and all the rest. So community level events are so important. Um, and it helps the fabric of the community. Also, economic development. So, if if there's a belief that there is a positive, you know, economic development, um, you know, increased revenues to merchants in different sectors, you know, we look at the costs and benefits of that. So, 
kind of that overarching, we always want to bring off safe events and always want to have community and economic uh, benefits to uh, both community members and the taxpayers. So those are kind of the policy level is issues that I want to you know, leave with the board. We're, our goal here was simply to provide information. As you start to get phone calls or questions about it, we want to make sure to give you good information for decision making and, and kind of a roadmap as to what decisions would need to be made should you choose to change, uh, to change what our current allocation is. So that concludes my remarks on this and happy to answer questions. We also have staff members here if we have questions on the special events, on the financial side, uh, and the permitting side. So we would be happy to, to hear the will of the board. All right, we're going to open this up a little bit for discussion on New Year's Eve. I tried to keep up with you, James. You're talking so fast, and I, oh, I can't hear too good, so I did the best I could. Uh, you know, this New Year's Eve event has gotten a little bit contentious, and it shouldn't have been. It should be one of many of his major events. We've got uh, July celebration. We've got Dare Day celebration, and there's no reason in the world we could not have a New Year's Eve celebration. Mich Michelle could come up with a good title that would enhance Manio, uh, uh, New Year's in Manio, or anything. You could come up with something novel, neat. We could bring people in from Richmond, Virginia, Tidewater, Virginia, Eastern North Carolina on New Year's Eve because nobody else has one that night. We could make it a major event. Uh, I don't know the feelings of the board. I don't have a vote, but I've got a voice, and uh, I see no reason in the world why we couldn't make it work, and I'm going somewhere with this. I do not think the businesses should have to raise the money to put on the event. I think it ought to be a major sponsored event by the town of Manhattan, uh that we, we take it over completely and run it. I've heard this confetti stuff and all that. If, if people don't want to work on New Year's Eve, I'm sorry. But uh, every New Year's I've seen other places on TV, they usually have confetti. I'm just saying I think we could make it and should make it a major event for Manio. Uh, and as far as the funding, I have taken the liberty on my own of being on the Tourist Bureau Board to talk to Mr. Nettles about financing for the fireworks. And he said, as you alluded to, James, that we would have to make application either uh, Michelle or you or somebody make formal application for the fireworks money but he saw no reason why we couldn't get money for the fireworks and then extend it I, I don't know about his kids program which is wonderful but early drop is good too if you want to have early drop New Year's Eve changes 1201 and uh, I think we should Consider that, but he said the possibility of us getting some money for fireworks would, right now, in his opinion, would be pretty good. And I've talked to some members on the Tourist Bureau board, and they would support our efforts in obtaining money. I don't know what it would take. Whatever you know about that, that's your affairs. I don't, I don't have any idea what the fireworks would cost. I just think it'd be a good idea, an enhancement for Manny if we had a New Year's Eve uh, get together for the people. And it wouldn't just be for Manny This People would come here from everywhere and they'd stay in motels and eat in restaurants and everything else for this event. That's my piece and I'd like to hear from the rest of the board on this because there's been evidently so much effort on this uh, New Year's Eve, we need to talk about it. James, can you go back to the slide where you said <coughs> the, the loss and profits of the event? Yes, sir. In three years, we lost what? Sixty-five thousand dollars. Yes. Yes, sir. We being a different this year. Do you think? Um, 
I mean, there, there's no reason to believe it'd be different. The fireworks, yes, I already spoke to the fireworks vendor, and they're available. They're, they say they've got much better availability on New Year's than they do on Fourth of July, of course, and so they are available. Um, the out cost estimate for them was forty-three to forty-five thousand. Um, one thing, um, a couple things that I would I would point out in terms of changes. I don't think we can make structural changes like how much it costs to get a band or portalettes or things like that. If, however, the visitors bureau and they've got a certain, we, they, we were actually walking through how we can get credit for more money in this, and if we can show more out of town visitors and find a way to document them. Last, you know, 2019, I was walking around getting license plates and interviewing people, and they, they're, they're giving us some ability to, to document what we've got. So if we can get more than the 20,000 that we got in prior years, which was an increase from the previous year, if we can get more money, that would help offset some of the loss. Um, but the fireworks still remain in that, still in that, you know, low to mid 40 range. Also, the donations and vendor fees. Um, I, I, I know uh, the, Mr. Mr. Mayor, the mayor alluded to going and asking businesses for donations. That's not something that we have done. Um, in fact, I will be. I will tell you that we have consciously, uh, as a as a as a town operational matter, when it came to, for example, whether it be national night out or other things, we've actually refrained from the path practice of going to businesses and asking for donations, whether it's donations of buns or ketchup or or cash. We're trying to give the message to our businesses that we support them and we want to support, we actually want to buy local and which we have done, whether it's you know, contractors or businesses or, or, or food. So we want to support them, not take money out of their pockets. So we've consciously, for our events, gotten away from asking for donations or things like that. We want to support our businesses. So I hope that information is helpful in saying kind of the, 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 the changes we might have here. We, we can try and get extra grant revenue to offset any donations or cost increases on, on fireworks and such. So, um, but but it would but it would take it would take funding by the town to do so. So I want to be very open and transparent about that. I have, I have to say immediately. Well, there's a couple things, but immediately, why? I mean, why isn't this being held at the event? site in Maxhead <laughs> if it's going to cost, you know, $80,000. Um, I just, I have spoken my piece about this in the past. Um, I will continue to say that I don't think there is a benefit to the town. And actually, it's probably more of a headache to most working class people. And I disagree with the mayor that people have to work on New Year's Eve. I absolutely do not want our employees to have to work on New Year's Eve. Um, and the issue with the confetti was not the confetti in itself. <laughs> it was that the confetti was <laughs> not supposed to be there. It was supposed to be biodegradable. Then. It was not even supposed to be thrown, and it was anyway. And so, I just, I'm not, not the biggest fan of it. And, um, you know, we have a tremendous, tremendous Christmas event. We have, you know, like we say, we just had the great Fourth of July event. Um, I just don't know. I just. I just don't see the benefit and most people that I talk to don't either and you know a lot of people have to get up the next day and go to work or you know they don't want to hear fireworks at midnight in the winter time so that's you know what I have to say I think um, you know if we if we look back at how it's gone um, you know with the confetti and like I said it was a little bit more to that you know, it uh, it kind of shows the need for the, the uh, business association, right? It, it's tough to uh, partner with an unorganized group of merchants. And so, um, you know, I, I think if we were to do it, we've got to do it the way that the mayor suggested, which is to say, this is not a merchant thing. This is town of Manio. This is event, and we're making the decision to, um, to take it. I, I, very respectfully um, disagree. I think it's great for Manio, and um, you know it is. It, it's it's 
the biggest thing around. I think it's been a great event in the past. And, you know, we, we talked about it for two seconds before the meeting started. Um, and, and the mayor said, well, you guys will probably be full for three days. And I thought, you know, well, forget three days. It's probably a month. And I think that this event is actually businesses have said, well, well, you know, we normally close, but we're going to stay open. And there's been more just foot traffic around town. That, that's just, that, that's what I've seen and that's what I've um, heard. And, uh, you know, I, yeah, so I, I, I do, I, I know we made a decision not to do it. Um, and I, I think that was probably, um, in my opinion, cause that, that, was, that was a mistake. And, and it is a, it's a good event and we should take it. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's, it's the impact, the, the community impact to having busier winter going into it, um, I think it is great. And this is a great year to hopefully, like I said, get, get out there and, you know, big hugs on, on big events. And, and I will say also the special events committee, um, just to throw this out there, um, who met last week. Um, and I know that we've got a letter here from them pushing their support. They were they were very supportive of it. Um, and I think it's important to mention all the folks that you talk to that, that don't want it, and that's an important voice. Um, the people I hear from mostly do are in supportive of it and are surprised that, that it isn't a town event. So there's my long winded piece on that. Eddie? Yeah, my opinion of it is um, I think instead of it being a, a partnered event, I think it should be a town sponsored event, the town should take it over. Um, that way, if there's any, um, you know, issues, we would have ownership of those and we could correct them. If there was a confetti issue, then it's the, the town can control that, um, that aspect of it. Or if there's any other issues, the town could take ownership of it. I think it's a good event. Um, I saw it more of a, when I've been there, um, seeing more people from the town there. And I think that's a good event. It's kind of off season. Um, if we can celebrate with each other, I think that's a great thing. Um, I don't know what the economic impact is to the businesses, but I don't know if we, we operate any event where we have a gain in revenue. Um, I don't think it's about that. I think it's about um, spending time together with each other, celebrating the new year, um, and getting together. And I, I really think after the past year, year and a half, we, we need an event to spend time together. So I support it being a town of the day. I echo what, um, what has been said about supporting it. Um, the last one we had, I attended. I attended it for the early ball drop for the children. I attended it later on at midnight. And the number of people that showed up speaks for itself. We had a lot of people downtown there. We had a lot of people enjoying the event. So other than the financial impact, it spoke for itself. It was a lot of people here. People enjoying it, milling around. So I know this year, um, on the, right coming after COVID, people will certainly, certainly attend and appreciate what the town of Man is, uh, did at this event. Um, the second thing is, how many events, if we look at events the town sponsored in the last three years, how many events lost money? I'm sure this ain't the only one, and it may be. Um, not I didn't interrupt you, don't interrupt me. So what I would like to see is that, but regardless, if this is the only event, or if this is the, you know, we had two events that lost money, it's good for the town coming off of COVID. So I fully support it. I attended the event more than one year. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're having a Christmas event like two, three weeks prior to for people to get out and see each other. Um, and I just, you know, you're talking, the money you're talking about right now, you're talking about an, uh, a penny on the tax rate. So, you know, if, if, if if the rest of, you know, if y'all want to vote for it, go ahead. I'm not voting for it. I'm not going to support it. Uh, the supporters, the organizing committee, they know how I feel. I've felt the way since the very beginning. 
um, you know, the family friendly part of it, I, I totally support. So eight o'clock, I totally support that. After that, I don't believe any town staff, employees, you know, I don't think it should be, I mean, it's music and drinking after that point. There is no, you know, there's hardly any businesses open at that point. Maybe the few restaurants, the motels, I'm not disregarding any of that as well. And for them to benefit, that's great. But it just does not warrant the type of money that we're putting out for it. I mean, um, you know, this is the, what, fourth or fifth year now that we've talked about it and you know, just feel like there's a reason why it wasn't a town event in the beginning, but I'll do what you want to do. All right, James. This is for discussion. Should we throw it up for a vote tonight? It's up to the board, I know, or keep further discussion going. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity to comment. Um, given that the pol I, I kind of laid out earlier what, what steps the board would have to take for it to become a town run event. Um, and what I could do based on what I'm hearing, that, hearing now is simply to prepare those things for which the board could vote at its August meeting. Then you could throw it up for a vote then when, when I can just go ahead and lay out these steps. You could make a vote at that time and we'd go ahead and apply for the grant should that vote go in favor of a town run event. All right, right now I'm hearing three to two without a vote. Uh, so we'll, we'll take your suggestion, we'll hold it off. I was wondering about if it passes, if it does. We're gonna to have to take in consideration the funding from the Tourist Bureau and make an application for, uh, but I think we'd have time, wouldn't we? Yes, sir, we would be, if the board voted at its, August, at its meeting in August, we would have time to apply. Okay, we, all right, well, we'll, we'll table this until the meeting in, uh, wait a minute, will we meet in August? The first meeting, sir, the first Wednesday in August will be our meeting, and that's the only meeting in August. Cause okay. Th th I think All right, we'll, we'll, we'll delay this and postpone it until the uh, August meeting, and we can go can, on. Can we delay it till the, till the workshop meeting? There's not a workshop meeting. Not a workshop meeting. And we'll have until the, the August 15th to apply for that grant, is that yeah, right? So the workshop right. would put us... Yeah would put us after I no I'm, I'm sorry well I think there was some some cross uh, cross pollination here let me let me be clear we only have one meeting in August but I'm sorry board of commissioners only has one meeting in August that would be Wednesday August 4th there's well, not a second meeting in August they recess we're going to table this to the meeting in August the 4th I think the, the mayor has the authority to control the agenda am I right yes sir I thought so Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll place it. Uh, we'll have that. Um, we'll have that report prepared for the board to vote on it on August fourth, and then um, we'll we'll be prepared for the application should it should it uh, should it pass. Um, also, the next item up would be public comment. So this is item number five. Members of the public are invited to address the board of commissioners on any topic. Public comment is not intended to require the board to answer any impromptu questions or to take any action on items brought up during the public comment period. Speakers will address all the comments to the board as a whole and not one individual commissioner. Discussions between speakers and members of the audience will not be allowed. Time limits are three minutes per person or five minutes per group. Please identify yourself and location so that your statements can be recorded. Mr. Mayor, I believe we have, we, we have nobody, uh, nobody desiring to take advantage of the public comment period. And of course, uh, we are in an in-person session this time. All right, would anyone like to be heard at the public comment period? No one coming forth, we'll close comment period. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, next up is item number six. This is mayor and commissioner's comments. All right, I have one other item. This won't be as contentious. Uh, I don't know what our salaries are for a policeman. Have no idea, have not looked into it, and maybe I'm guilty of being remiss of not paying no attention. I do know this. Nags Head, Kitty Hawk, Kildare Hills, 
Southern Shores pay their policemen adequately. And we have a new commission or authority, whatever it's called. What is the new police group? Uh, the Community Police Advisory Board, sir. Okay. Maybe we need to task them along with the manager and the manager taking the chair of that meeting and heading it up and talk about salaries for the policemen. They might be adequate, they might not be, but I've heard many times that the uh, municipalities on the beach pay uh, much more money to their policemen than we pay ours. Our policemen are just as much in danger in Manio as they are in Nags Head or Kill Devil Hills. They're just as susceptible of being shot in Manio as they are on the beach. They have the same amount of problems, not as many, but they still have the dope, the break-ins, everything. And I think it's only fair that we think and consider of looking at the police salaries and make them compatible or close to compatibility with the beach officers and the beach police. I don't know what it is. I'm being very broad on this, but I've been thinking about it that we've got a good police force. We've got a, uh, everything's going fine. I, I actually am having people come to me want to talk to the manager about backing, police backing off giving too many tickets. <laughs> I have had this, and mm -hmm. I have not done it, have I? No, sir. Chief, I ain't said a word to you, have I? <laughs> and I mean, they're all not by tickets and this and that. And so if they're doing that, they're doing their job. And I just think we need to treat our policemen as fairly as they're being treated on the beach. So they won't want to leave here and go over there and apply for employment. So that's my, my, my comments, and uh, I'm gonna open it up. Uh, Betty? I think they should be paid usually, um, you know, we're not as big as some of them, but just like you said, when you come to um, take your risk, we'll take the same risk with the uh, police department. Um, we don't wanna be a training brand like not making salary and they come to Manio and we hire them and food them, they come from three or four hours away and then they wind up staying here and get a nice offer from other municipalities and they go. We should be able to hold our own regardless of the salary. So yes, I, I, I support you may on that. Our police department, um, they do very well. They do excellent. So I would support making sure that their rate, their salary is comparable. Hello? Yes, sir. Okay. Christine? Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about, um, are there sprinklers at the town commons? Okay, I just, some, they just maybe looked a little, I know we, well, except for recently, we hadn't had much <laughs> rain. <laughs> we had a little deluge, but um, just, you know, wanted to make sure that everything out there is um, growing and being nurtured. Um, and the drinking fountains that are throughout town, are we, are they back on now? They all are back on? Because Yes, okay. yes Commissioner, we, we did have one that was okay. vandalized, um, okay. um, but other than that one, they're back on. Also, we were, can, we were planning to get one out of Town Common as well, okay. uh, as part right. of this process, yeah, perhaps even before this process, because the building will take right. longer than getting a drinking fountain for both the two-legged folks as well as perhaps the four-legged critters. Uh, Eddie? Melissa, you did a great job. You saved a lot of people some money, so you're owed a lot of beers. Um, <laughs> the police department is something that is familiar with me, so um, I didn't know you were going to talk about it today, but I agree with uh, not only paying, and I'll be broad here and say all town employees. I think all town employees should be paid more and trained more. Um, that way we can not only retain our employees, but recruit the cream of the crop from other places if needed. So I agree wholeheartedly that, um, I don't know if any town employee could ever be paid a mutt enough. I, I don't know if there's a, a salary high enough for that you deserve. Um, 
So I agree that uh, salaries should be looked at the police department. Also training, I'd like to see training budgets increase as well. Um, but I'd also recommend that um, across the board to all town employees. I'd like to see all our town employees make um, similar or maybe even a little bit more than, than uh, neighboring towns. That's all I've got. Jason? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'll continue to echo the, the police uh, thing, and I have no idea where we, we stand that. I guess I should be a, a shame to say, but uh, I know that we've got an awesome force, um, and we do a great job, so I, I feel like we've got the best, and I, I hope that they're, they're compensated just like that, just like they should be. Um, everyone's got different opinions on, on uh, everything. You know, we've all interact in our different... Uh, you know, lives with, with different different groups. And so we all get these different perspectives and they're all very important. And we can only take what we hear into consideration and what we know and what we seek out. And so um, I might be signing this all up for a long meeting, but I hope we get lots of public comment um, before we make a decision on the New Year's Eve thing um, so that we can equip ourselves to not do the best thing that I think would be good or the best thing that you think would be good, but the best thing that the, the community wants and, uh, and should get. So, um, yeah, like I said, it may be a long meeting next time, but that's all I got. <laughs> okay. Dow? I'm this for town manager. Uh, any update on the Amy Design Church uh, lease agreement with Car Right Farm? Yes, that one actually has, has gone to the town attorney's office because there, was, there had to be a little bit of work on the on the lease itself. Without the lease was submitted, of course, a while back, uh, and the and the bishop was was willing to sign. However, there was a question with the attestation, and then also then the how that title flowed. So, town attorney's office is already working on that issue. So, I, I don't know if you care to comment, but at this point, it's being handled by by fine fine capable people. My partner Robert Hobbs is our real estate expert, and he's he's been looking at that. I don't know where it stands right now, but I'll follow up with him and find out. I agree about the police department. I think years ago we did some feasibility studies on the police department salaries, and I think we did uh, increase the, uh, the new employees, uh, new police be comparable to the, the other municipalities. Um, but it's a good thing to look at it. It's a good feeling. Okay. Uh, that's it for comments from the mayor and commissioners. Uh, anything else come before the board? Yeah. I forgot to thank Chief Haskett for sending me to my police department. <coughs> my tutoring program, Monday Night Live, we had a special set session that ran four Mondays in July and we were exposing the kids to different things and training them and thank you Chief Haskett and Sergeant Burris, James Burris and the town manager. They came out, they did bicycle safety, um, they did just plain safety about walking on the streets, what side, what you should do and gave out our children which we're very happy to get a few items to take home. So I do appreciate that. Thank you for the community support and um, the kids enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank hey, God. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, All right. Uh, can this has been a pretty quick meeting? Can we have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion we adjourn. I second. Motion and second that we adjourn until uh, the regular meeting August the fourth at six thirty. All right, we stand adjourned.